recently, we caught up with Angie Patterson. She's a plant ecophysiologist, which means she studies how trees function in a changing environment. Safety off. Though for her, studying looks a little different. Fire! Great shot, Angie. They don't call me Angie Oakley for nothing. <laughs> Angie is hunting down tree branches for a very important reason. She's studying how and why trees migrate. It turns out tree populations move. They abandon their old homes and seek out new ones. They've been doing this since at least the last ice age. But today, most trees are not moving fast enough. And that's forcing forest managers and ecologists to make hard decisions about what to save and what to leave behind. So what do we mean when we say tree migration? How do trees move from one place to another? Trees in Georgia can't literally pick themselves up and walk to, say, New York, but they do travel 10 to 20 kilometers per decade by spreading their seeds. Seeds can get from point A to point B in a few ways. Animals, wind, and water can all carry them to new locations. Some trees can even shoot seeds out, like bullets, by popping the capsules of their seed pods. However seeds land in a new area, if the environment is suitable, a new community of trees might put down roots. As the area the trees originally came from becomes less hospitable due to changes in temperature and precipitation, those trees start to die off. So gradually, trees pop up on one part of the map and disappear on another. It's a migration, kind of like a flock of geese or a herd of bison, just on a very different time scale. And these migrations have been observed for millennia. But rising global temperatures and changing weather patterns are accelerating the moves. In the northeastern United States, temperatures have already risen by 0.8 degrees Celsius in the past 30 years. And within the next 50, some scientists project New York's climate will feel closer to Virginia's. To keep up with those shifts, trees need to move fast. But can they? This race is on display in Black Rock Forest, just north of New York City, where for years, Angie has been keeping tabs on the movement of tree species, including the northern red oak. Very important tree species um, in this forest because it makes up about 70% of the forest composition. As the climate shifts, new trees are also moving in, and the future of the red oak and the whole forest is uncertain. So I'm comparing the physiological responses to temperature of trees in order to see if there's a physiological mechanism that's driving tree migration. To learn how Black Rock's trees respond to changing temperatures, Angie needed leaves. You want to make sure that you have a clean shot because I've done, believe me, I've had plenty of leaves with holes in it. For Angie, the best leaves to study were all the way at the top of the canopy because they get a consistent and even amount of sunlight. So we're going to want to go to the branch towards the middle there, right in that open space. But those leaves are really hard to get to, hence the heavy weaponry. The shotgun was actually a very efficient and cheap way to collect my samples. Over the course of three years, Angie used her shotgun to collect leaves from 23 tree species, including the red oak. Fire! Using a device called a LICOR, she subjected the leaves to different temperatures and CO2 levels and measured their photosynthesis and respiration. Covering the chamber completely. Basically, she wanted to see how each of the species would respond to different swings in the climate. And then I compared their photosynthetic rates and respiration rates as temperatures increase. She found that the red oak and some other trees are at a real disadvantage compared to other trees that are moving in, meaning the red oaks could be displaced. So the worst case scenario is that northern red oaks, in this forest at least, could be dying, and that would really open up the forest floor to a lot of other tree species or plant species or invasive species to come in. In the best case scenario, southern trees migrating into Black Rock will pick up the slack and keep the forest thriving. But that's assuming they arrive in time. With the climate changing at such a rapid pace, trees might have to move up to 10 times faster in order to reach areas that they'll thrive in. 
And some researchers estimate that up to 39% of plant species are committed to extinction because they won't be able to move fast enough or won't have anywhere to move to. So if trees can't keep up with climate change, should we help them? One proposal that's getting more attention is called assisted migration. Assisted migration is essentially, I like to think of it as a colloquial, sort of familiar way of talking about what we also call managed relocation. Jessica Hellman is an ecologist who co-authored one of the first papers on this subject in the mid-2000s. The idea is simple. Humans could assist or help in the process of a species changing its geographic distribution or where it lives on Earth. At first, assisted migration was controversial in academia. In fact, one of the most well-known efforts was carried out by a loose collective of citizen scientists called the Terea Guardians. They've been trying to save the critically endangered Florida Terea. A fungus blight brought on by environmental changes has pretty much wiped them out. In 2008, they collected 31 Terea seedlings and planted them in Waynesville, North Carolina, 400 miles north. This made a lot of conservationists nervous. Some worried that the species could become invasive or screw up its new habitat. Others felt that we shouldn't help ecosystems reconfigure themselves at all. We should try to preserve nature the way it is. The way it should be. But scientists today are realizing there's a problem with that line of thinking. We tend to think that ecosystems should be restored to how they used to be or how they're supposed to be or a healthy state. And there were arguments at the time about what time, what baseline should be used or how humans have manipulated ecosystems historically. But when you change the climate, that baseline isn't relevant anymore. You can't go back to how this, in many cases, you wouldn't be able to go back to how the system used to be or was supposed to be. In other words, human-induced climate change has irrevocably altered the planet. We've hit the point where instead of simply asking if or when we should get involved in moving or saving a species, we have to ask harder questions. We have to make pragmatic decisions about what is worth saving and why. And then we probably do have to intervene. There's not a hands-off, do no harm. There's allow the climate change to proceed and do nothing or try to intervene and also bear the consequences and the cost of that intervention. Those are the choices that climate change is presenting. National parks are asking these questions and making these decisions now with the help of Jessica and her colleagues. They recently put together a workbook to help the Park Service think through the risks and benefits of managed relocation. It recommends asking why we want to move a species. Are we saving it because we like looking at it or because it's critical to an ecosystem? A lot of it has to do with ecology, of course. Can you move them? How would it, how would it work? Uh, but a lot of it does not have to do with ecology. There are questions of resources, money, buy-in from stakeholders, from local governments, lumber producers, and hikers. What land is even available for the species to be moved to? Would someone sue? Indigenous perspectives are incredibly important, too. If you are associated with a place or you have rights in a place and you have cultural resources that you have been granted, climate change then becomes another, essentially another form of colonization. And I think that's an important value for all of us to understand and pay attention to. Of course, managed relocation does not address the root problems facing forests. It's a treatment of symptoms. At the end of the day, the best way to protect biodiversity is, you guessed it. We should just stop emitting greenhouse gases. That would be the more cost-effective and smarter way of going about doing this. We need bigger actions because simply relocating trees may not be sufficient. The idea that we're going to manage or conserve biodiversity by moving things around one by one, it's just not good enough. Humanity depends on the preservation of most things that are living on this earth. We need them. And moving them around is probably not going to get the job done. 
Is this cause any drama with the bird researchers? <laughs> no, it has not. <laughs> I, I, I've been lucky enough not to uh, shoot down any wildlife, which is very fortunate.